Chris, could you tell me a little bit about the science of emails and how it relates to neuroscience? Uh, Lauren, I'm glad you asked me that question because this is becoming more and more critical than ever before. Uh, there's lots of research on this topic. In fact, one of my sons is a neuroscientist himself and sends me articles all the time on how neuroscience, uh, the study of how the brain operates, is playing a big factor in our emails. It's very interesting because if you look on how we're communicating day to day, emails are playing an ever increasing more critical part. Let's face it, nothing substitutes for emails because they are the business communication of today. Think about it. When's the last time you even got a hard copy of anything that wasn't a contract or an invoice? And as a result, we've got to rely on the emails. Uh, now, the future of emails, the future of project communication, is probably more like social media, where you, if you find, need to find out something about a project, it would be like Facebook or LinkedIn. You'd come to that location to find out about the project, and then you'd go elsewhere to go and do the work, and then come back to find out about this information. Oh, like the old uh, project websites used to be, uh, before they became too expensive, and uh, we're seeing a resuscitation of that with owners and contractors starting to use those pro project websites. But for right now, well, it's all about email and that being the project communication. The problem with email is 80% of c uh, communication is nonverbal. It's body language or a facial expression or tone of voice. And so email strips all of that out of communication. In fact, that's the reason for the little smiley face uh, icons. Uh, they're kind of saying, ha, 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 that was irony or sarcasm. Did you get that? Uh, well, if you have to use a little smiley face emoticon to communicate what you're trying to say, we think, well, that's OK if you're talking to your best friend. But if you're using that in any kind of professional business communication, we think you need to rephrase what you're talking about because those things with an emotional undertone or subtext are totally going to be lost. And in fact, the social neuroscientists have done the research. And they find, well, that since when you send out an email, you're doing it from inside your own head. Um, you're pretty much there, like we all are, inside of our own head with our own thoughts and our own context to place things in. So when you send out an email, the greatest risk is if you send out something you think is positive, I'll regard it merely as neutral. And if you send out something that you think is neutral, the greatest risk is I'll regard it as negative. And so what we want to do is certainly rely on emails. They're critical. But make it for factual distribution of communication and so that you have a contemporaneous data flow of all these critical things and agreements you've talked about and what the client has said and the direction they've given. I've had some clients who've even said, oh, Chris, you know, I don't think emails or uh, documentation is that critical. But what those people are really trying to do is have selective amnesia and um, remember things differently than you did. So of course, you've got to document everything as a good project manager. In fact, the studies have been done to show that we really only need about 20% of the documentation we create. But the problem is, we don't know which 20%. So we pretty much have to document everything. And well, if you look at, again, the social neuroscientists, they've done the research. And there's something called the principle of synchronicity. So as you and I talk, we synchronize with each other. I nod in response to what you say, and I respond ex precisely to what you're talking about. But email strips all of that out of communication. And so we've got these kind of disembodied things happening where actually younger people who are even more technologically facile than ever before are very used to communicating via text or email. And in some cases, we're even a little concerned that they're um, kind of losing their ability to socially interact because they're so great at electronic communication. We think you've got to reach out. And for those really emotion-laden kinds of issues, talk to clients. Talk to your other team members. In fact, studies have been done to show that you don't really get bonding across virtual team boundaries between uh, companies, between subcontractors or subconsultants and yourself, between even different floors of the same company in the same building, which might have different cultures. 
unless you get face-to-face -face or at least voice-to-voice -voice communication. And so while email is incredibly necessary, well, it's just not going to do everything you need to do as a project manager to have all your team on the same page together. And so you've got to create those opportunities for bonding uh, between different team members. The other thing about email is, well, uh, it creates some real challenges as far as taking over your day because by the speed of light transmittal of communication, everything starts to feel critical. And yet, it's really not. In many cases, if you didn't even see a lot of the emails that are happening day to day oh, for several hours at a time or even in the next day, it wouldn't make a darn bit of difference. We're starting to see people even saying to their clients, look, I'm trying to regain control of my life. Uh, I'm only going to answer emails at 11.30 and 4 o'clock every day, and so if this is a critical issue you've got to hear from me about, then please just reach out and call me on my cell or on my hard line because I'll be very responsive to that, but email is not going to take the place of that kind of critical voice-to-voice -voice communication. The other problem with email, and again the social neuroscientists have done the research here, is that it's physically addictive. So every time you answer an email, it sends a shot of dopamine into your brain. Dopamine affects the pleasure centers of your brain. And so if every time you answered an email, oh, 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 it felt so good to do that, and don't you just think it does now? Because aren't you really wondering, even as you're listening to me talk right now, that maybe you should be looking at your email on your smartphone and seeing if a client's emailing you right now? Well, that's just the feeling every one of us are starting to possess. And so as a result, though, Email is totally fragmenting our typical days into really small little pieces where if every time you allow that little you've got mail icon to float onto the face of your CRT screen or the little blinking light on your smartphone telling you, you've got mail, you've got mail, this must be something critical, and that distracts you from the task that you've got at hand, the time management experts have also weighed in as well. And they said every time that happens, you pay a time penalty. Uh, there's a time to defocus from the task at hand and to refocus on the next task, or the other task you've been distracted, this email coming in, and then to refocus on the task at hand. That time penalty is between 4 and 14 minutes. That's not the time it takes to do that other task. It's just the defocus and refocus time that you've just lost. Well, now think about it. Do any of you listening to this interview uh, get as many as, oh, four emails an hour? Oh, well, honestly, I'm sure all of you do. Uh, well, think about if every time you allowed yourself to be distracted by that email coming in the door, you paid a time penalty of, oh, let's just say it's four minutes, not even 10 or 12 or 14, but four minutes. And if you got as many as four emails an hour, times an eight-hour workday, and I bet many of you listening to this work more than eight hours a day, that would be 128 minutes of lost time every day I would like to give you back. Well, how would you feel about having two more hours of time every day? Here's the way to get that. Turn off your email. Oh, I know. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? It sounds like you'd be depriving yourself of, of the connection to the worldwide web of information and resources and knowledge and content. But I'm only asking you to do it for a while, because here's the other challenge that the time management experts have posed. If you look at, well, a lot of the project management activities that we perform, all that planning and statusing and tracking, controlling, cost estimating, scheduling, uh, invoicing, you know, getting paid, all these critical PM activities. Well, I ask people in my PM boot camps that I'm in almost every week, uh, and these are all, a lot of them, most of them project managers, I say, what percent of your work week do you think you spend in all these critical PM activities? And 70 to 80 percent of project managers respond that they spend less than 20 to 25 percent of the work week doing PM activities. And that is because most PMs in this great architecture, engineering, construction services uh, arena are really manager doers, or to put the emphasis where it probably belongs, doer managers. They're doing a lot of the technical and design work, even while they're managing it at the same time. And if there's a conflict between doing and managing, 
doing things to win out every time, because those are the deliverables, client crises, all these things that are so necessary for our success, and besides which, the doing of the work is what got you into this arena in the first place, not the project management. Well, so if that's the case, we've got to give you more ability to focus on those PM activities. And so what we think you need are, well, one, reminders from other outside sources, but also better time management. And so here's the key. The kind of knowledge work that you are all doing, listening to the sound of my voice, well, that just can't be done in little five and eight and ten minute segments of time. A lot of PM activities can be done in those kind of things, and even the time management experts say, take a typical hour and break it up into five or six or seven different little segments and see how many PM activities you can get done in those little segments of time. But the kind of knowledge work you're, a lot of you are doing that's consuming 70 or 80 percent of your work week, that needs big blocks of uninterrupted focus time of an hour or two to check documents or to create the great design or to do the good quality reviews or to do the great technical work that you're all churning out. So we think you need to take more control of your own life and get those big blocks of focus time, not as many of you are doing now before 8 in the morning or after 6 or 7 o'clock at night after everyone's gone home, but during the course of the work day, turn off your email server for a while. Uh, I know. <laughs> Sounds terribly hard to do, but we found people having enormous levels of success just doing something as simple as that for just a couple hours a day. I'm not saying much of the day because most of your clients are very concerned that you're not getting these critical emails they're sending you. In fact, have you ever had a client do this? Um, they send you an email and it doesn't even particularly critical stuff, but half hour later or less they call and ask, haven't you sent seen my email yet? Uh, and you're sitting there wondering to yourself in a kind of a bemused way, why are they even calling me? This wasn't even that critical uh, kind of information. The reason is because they want to make sure you've seen this email and the ball is in your court because until they know they have that that's occurred, they're not sure you're really on the job. They're looking for something that Oh, don't, have you ever gotten one of these things? It's kind of problematic. One of these emails with a return receipt requested. Oh, isn't that painful? Because it's kind of saying, I don't really trust you not to have really seen this email. So I want a return receipt. I've got one of my associates who does that on every email he sends. And I, uh, it's just kind of irksome, isn't it? Because a lot of the stuff people send isn't even that critical. They just want to know you've gotten it. Well, we think we need to retrain our clients and our other project team members not to expect an instantaneous response on things that are non-critical, but I'm going to give you an easy way to, well, solve that client perception issue, and that is if a client sends you an email that's rather important, we think you ought to, if you're not busy doing something else, send a response back in the next few minutes. Oh, the client will be astonished. It'll be like, you're just sitting there waiting uh, for them to uh, contact you, and you're right on it, right uh, responding to their particular issue. But here's the way to do this. You don't need to actually answer anything in the email. You just need to say to the client, well, you know, this one critical thing, I'll be getting back to you later on today. These other two or three things are not quite so critical, I don't believe. Those things I'll be getting to you by the end of the week. And the client can oh, breathe a sigh of relief and rest easy knowing you're on the job. This really connects the clients to us and vice versa because it makes you look legitimately extremely responsive to their needs, but it doesn't put you at the mercy of this email system where everything appears to achieve huge levels of criticality because of the speed of light transmittal nature of emails, which are this great resource, but also can be a tremendous way to waste a lot of time during your course of your day and preoccupy your time away from all those other critical things that you're doing as well as we hope managing as well the secret to project management success. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. Now, can you give our listeners some tips on how they might be able to use emails more effectively? 
certainly. Um, there's lots of very important things about emails because, again, we think they are the business communication of today. For one thing, we think you should have a standard signature line, and it should be consistent throughout your entire company, saying everybody's on the same page here, we're all using the same signature line, and so it provides basic information, contact data on how to get hold of you so I can cut and paste that into my Outlook directory. Two is, we think, um, you should use the subject line very judiciously. And so as the nature of this email that goes back and forth and an email chain changes, then please feel free to change the subject line so that I will know without even having to open up this email on my smartphone what the content of this is. And if it's particularly critical, I can click on it and open it up. We think also you need to have a way to capture and file emails into a filing system. Uh, there's many, uh, or there's a couple of uh, pretty big systems that are available, software systems, that are search engine optimizers that let those emails go into a file or be searchable so we don't have to drag and drop emails into a file folder because what we're finding is, you know, in the old days, oh my goodness, project managers had admin assistants who would do this for you. They'd take the hard copy and they'd physically file it into a file folder. But now we're feeling that project managers, well, because of the wonderfulness of PCs and laptops, are becoming their own admins. And so they're spending inordinate amounts of hours just doing what I've just described. So we think creating a rule where emails flow into a particular file folder, or perhaps um, having a standard, as many companies do, of putting the project number in the email, either in the subject line, or I've seen some companies who make the project number an email address, and everyone must CC the project number, whatever it is, in the email, and so it automatically goes there. Now that creates a fair amount of duplicative emails, and if you've got a lot of big attachments, that can be a little bit of a burden on your servers in terms of the memory capacity. But it makes it easier than you're becoming your own admin, which again we see is becoming a big challenge, since you obviously want all the emails relating to a particular project to all reside there in the same location so you can easily access them and so you can file them at the end of the project. We also think when people uh, send you an email, you shouldn't just turn around and send it to your project team, you know, Bob, Sally, and Martha, and say, take care of this. You should be very explicit in spelling out, Bob, please take care of item one and three. Sally, you take care of item two, and Martha, item four and five, those are things that we'd like to get done by the end of the week. Be very explicit in sending emails on and forwarding them on to other people about what you're telling them to do, since that delegation is something that all of you are doing, unless you're a team of just one person, inevitably, as a project manager, you're going to be delegating a lot of those activities. So be very explicit in spelling out the information that you're delegating so you can have that maximum value and minimized confusion as far as what you're directing or requesting that they do. We also think that, well, if you're sending out an email out of house, we think you should put a, a salutation at the top of the email. It could be just, I don't think it has to say, dear Tom, it could just say Tom, because if you don't have that name at the top of the email, think how less formal your email sound. Sounds kind of like a text message or some kind of just an informal communique, which could be fine for in-house usage, but for sending to a client, well, since email is the business communication of today, we think you should treat it in a fairly formal way, which means no text language or abbreviations or acronyms. Spell things out. And again, at the very bottom, have your contact information so clients can reach out and, and talk to you. And indeed, we encourage that as well. We think that just emailing people is not going to create that bonding over teams between virtual boundaries of different teams and different firms. And so creating different opportunities for talking together is really something we should be doing. In fact, I see people emailing each other or texting five feet apart in offices now. And we think just standing up and poking over the workstation wall or, or walking around and talking to people, we think you should be doing that every day is talking to every member of your project team or somebody else should be in your stead, say your surrogate in a remote other office location to make sure your project is staying on track. That's one of your key responsibilities as a project manager. Thank you so much, Chris. My pleasure. Thank you, Lauren.